Thank you for watching CBSM Minnesota. I'm Shayla Reeves. February is Black History Month, a nationally recognized celebration of African American contributions to U.S. history. Over the next half hour, we're bringing you the stories of leaders in our community who are working to celebrate Black history. We begin with WCCO's Reg Chapman, who shows us some of the places dedicated to sharing the legacy of Black people in Minnesota. We just started an initiative called Black History, Black Voices which has got a number of resources for people to learn about black history. The Minnesota Historical Society has a treasure trove of resources from information on how black women broke barriers to the black liberation movement. Articles, photographs, and interviews can all be found online. There's also information about the history of slavery in Minnesota. Historic Fort Snelling uh, is a place where slavery existed. Harriet and Dred Scott both were there, and um, the stories about them and slavery in Minnesota are on display and exhibit at the Historic Fort Snelling. Fort Snelling artifacts can also be found online. The Hennepin County Library System is another great place to look. Well, you can find a wealth of resources, a wealth of books, um, artwork, we have lots of materials. A lot of the things that we're doing right now because of COVID protocols, a lot of these things will be online. This exhibit will transport you to a place in time and history some will find painful to see. They don't represent somebody's opinion. They don't represent what somebody thinks. They represent facts and what people did. Testify is a collection of black history artifacts from Justice Alan Page and his late wife, Diane Sims Page. It features bricks made by slaves to build the White House and a slave collar used in Virginia in the 1820s. These images are also available online. We're a 91-year-old organization and have been the central gathering place for the African-American community in St. Paul. The Halle Q. Brown Center in St. Paul is the keeper of black history from the historic Rondo neighborhood. Our original location was originally an African-American Union Hall. The original building was lost to the expansion of I-94 a project that divided St. Paul's black community and is all documented in the library of the Halle Q. Brown Center. So when you're on the highway, you're driving on 94, you're driving through somebody's living room that never invited you. People are invited to the African American Heritage Museum and Gallery, as well as to view the pages and exhibits of the Minnesota Spokesman Recorder, the oldest black owned newspaper in the state. Black History Month can come alive for anyone who wants to learn more. Reg Chapman, WCCO 4 News. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, many local and national institutions have added resources to their websites, including the National Humanities Center. You can learn more at nationalhumanities.org. The issue of equality in education is a central part of Black History Month. In 2017, a state report showed that of the nearly 64,000 teachers in Minnesota, 875 were black. That's less than 2%. And there are even fewer black men in our classrooms. But as WCCO's Aaron Hazanzada shows us, there's a group working to change that. So let's start with a review. Same There's nothing always. unusual about Marcus Flynn's fifth grade science lesson today. Do I eat chili with sugar? Do I eat chili with sugar? No. But the fact that he's the one teaching it no. is pretty rare. And There's very few black teachers. Nationally, only 2% of teachers are black men. In the state of Minnesota, it's even worse. So I figured if I want to make the biggest impact, have the biggest benefit on my community, best place for me to do is in the classroom. And for Flynn, the classroom is just the start. He's also the executive director of Black Men Teach, an organization focused on building a pipeline for creating and retaining black teachers. People like Keith Durham, a junior at Hamlin University and member of Black Men Teach. In my head, like being from Minnesota, a teacher is um, an older Caucasian lady. Durham, who grew up in St. Paul and Woodbury, says he never liked school. But looking back, he thinks it's because no one understood what he was going through outside of the classroom. When I was in second grade, my dad went to prison. It would have been a big, a big push for me to actually focus on school and somebody to tell me, like, you don't need to just play basketball or be a rapper. Like, there's actual jobs out here that are in need of your services. It's hard to make an argument that there's anything more important to the success of black students than black teachers. The impact is tangible. Research shows that students who have two black male teachers in elementary school are 32% more likely to enroll in college. One black teacher by third grade can decrease the likelihood of a student dropping out of high school by almost 40%. Relationships are so important in education, and I think that's the thing we have to focus on. And those relationships are important for white students as well. 
students who don't identify as black, it helps them rethink their understanding of what black men are in society. Just having that simple saying of you can do it and you can achieve something, I think does tremendous work. But it creates generational change, generational impact. Black Men Teach partners with eight schools in the metro. The group is working to help make sure black men make up 20% of the school staff in those partnered schools in the next five years. Next, we bring you the story of one North Minneapolis dad who's helping students in his community attend college. I met with Tito Wilson to learn more about his scholarship program and the impact he's making on the lives of promising students. And here's the remaining balance of your scholarship. Thank you. And here's the remaining balance of your scholarship for this year. Thank you. He's a dad, a business owner, and to his North Minneapolis neighbors, Mr. Tito. You see our smiles through the mask? <laughs> Inside this space, he's cutting more than hair. He's crafting a dream. It makes me feel proud, absolutely. A dream that started with his daughter. My daughter is the reason why I decided to start this scholarship program, watching how she applied for different scholarships, some that she received, some that she did not. So I just decided, you know, hey, what can I do to help make sure that our uh, scholars, inner city scholars, are able to get scholarships? From that, a scholarship program was born. So the word got out about the scholarship. And then so people started making contributions. What started as an idea became bigger than the dad just wanting to make a difference. And then it just started to grow organically. You know, different people in the community, uh, different business owners, customers that come in here, they heard about it. They, hey, what can we do? Usually the things that start small and grow are the best things. Shauna Moses is a mother and North Minneapolis resident. In the same place, the same streets that I walked, <laughs> The same schools that I attended to see right within that same community, people are still pouring in. It just creates a warmth inside. Her daughter, Ayu Alagbaju, is part of the third scholarship class. Youth today, we're the future of what the community will become. So to have someone who sees who you are already and um, is willing to invest in that, that's, yeah, that's a great experience. I hope that she holds it close, you know, when things get tough, as life may do, um, that she still knows that she, there's a village, there's a support network that is here for her and it extends beyond blood relations. Neighbors helping neighbors one scholar at a time. It feels amazing to know that people who live here and who watch you every day, you know, they just have like an arm on your shoulder, like it's okay, you know, we got you. I believe in the people and I believe they believe in me. I've been in business here in North Minneapolis for 13 years. We have a powerful community. You know what I mean? Some people look at Tito says 10 $1,000 scholarships have already been given out since the program began. For more information on how you can help, visit WCCO.com slash links. Police officer Charlie Adams is no stranger to the north side of Minneapolis. He grew up in the neighborhood and is now the inspector of the 4th Precinct. As Reg Chapman shows us, it's a role he's taking head on in a community he knows inside and out. I probably spent most of my life in North Minneapolis. As a child growing up in North Minneapolis, Charlie Adams spent most of his time hanging out at a community center called The Way. Now he is the new inspector for Minneapolis Police's 4th Precinct, working in the same building he used to play in as a kid. I really haven't felt like I left home, but it's, it's, I'm happy being able to take over the, the leadership of the 4th Precinct. Adams grew up in the housing projects not far from the 4th Precinct. His path to policing began and remains his effort to change the system from within. My goal was to come on the police department and do the best I could do for myself, for the community, most definitely. Community is what Adams is all about. He's been defensive coordinator for North High's football team for the past several years. Giving back to the youth in the community has been his focus since he joined the department. That's my goal, to make sure that we get those kids who understand what it is to be in this city and how, and how important it, it is to be a police officer in the city, because you give back that way. And the community expects big things from Adams. The violence is what many hope he can quiet. I can't stop the violence, but hopefully I can unite our community where we can work towards that goal of reducing violence. Adams believes community and police working together can make the difference. We have to really get back to community, and that's what we don't have, Reg. I know we have the older, you know, our civil rights folks who constantly preach community, but I think the younger generation got to understand that we got to get back to that village. A village that nurtures is young. 
protects his elders and provides housing and employment opportunities is what Adam hopes to nurture during his time as inspector. My message is, hey, we need to knock this off. We need to just have an environment where we can all thrive in and, and feel safe. And Being safe comes with accountability for the officers he commands as well as for the community he loves and serves. Hey, we're going to hold you accountable. You know, we really are, especially over here. I mean, I'm over here to make sure that our community is safe. You know, I'm not saying I have all the answers and, you know, to, to the problems, but I'm most definitely going to have support when I have to put, you know, if you do something wrong and you go to jail and the community is going to support what we've done. Reg Chapman, WCCO, 4 News. Adams is not the only member of his family that works in law enforcement. His son and daughter both followed him into police work. Coming up, we'll take you inside the bookstore in Minneapolis that's owned and operated by a new generation of community leaders. Following a summer of civil unrest, many nonprofits received an influx of support and donations from around the country. WCCO's Marielle Mose explains how one nonprofit used this support to not only amplify voices in their community, but to create a space for those voices to thrive. Each space is named after a black writer. So this is the little Lorraine Hansberry um, reading nook. On the walls, you... For Kino Evolve, this new space is a passion project he's been working on since 2015, when he first brought young black artists together following the death of Michael Brown. There was a void that needed to be filled in black folks in, um, in, in Minnesota having a space um, to talk about our joys and our grievances. The purpose of Black Table Arts Cooperative lies in its name a place for black artists to have a place at the table. So to keep a promise to our com community that we will always provide a space for you to return to. The Black Table Arts Cooperative is located about six blocks away from the Minneapolis Police 3rd Precinct that was burned down in the uprising following George Floyd's death. The proximity to this location was intentional. I think grief presents um, an opportunity for a connection and art meets that need. It also kind of changing the narrative of like there was so much negativity. Alfred Sanders is the cooperative's director of operations. He's also a singer who plans to mentor and learn with other black artists in this space, helping each other recover after a year that's put a lot of artists out of work. With anything, you need a following and just that this can be a great place for people to have start their foundation to get their following or just practice their skills. Art isn't the only draw for Sanders. I lost my father with police brutality uh, very close to where George uh, lost his life 20 years prior. He hopes he will find healing here through art while keeping his father's memory alive through connection. In South Minneapolis, Marielle Mose, WCCO 4 News. The Black Table Arts Cooperative is working to grow, eventually housing a bookstore, co-working spaces and performance spaces. To some people, basketball may just be a game. However, for one Minneapolis man, basketball is a guiding light in his life. I met with Therese Van Pell to hear how he helps student athletes find their purpose on and off the court. I definitely feel like what I'm doing right now is a part of my life's purpose. It's been in my heart for a long time. For trainer Therese Van Pelt, basketball is more than just a game. It's a tool for changing lives. My saying is that where there's disadvantage, there's opportunity. The court is his classroom. There's so many things in the game of basketball that someone can learn, such as discipline, commitment, um, respect, getting along with others. Lessons start with a plan for every player. I believe that you know these players is just one mentor away from uh, being successful or doing um, achieving their life's purpose. Therese is the owner of TVP Basketball or Tunnel Vision on Purpose. It's a mobile basketball training business. He uses the sport to bridge divides, build community, and help Minnesota youth achieve their potential. And then ripping up and going for I always was a, a natural teacher and a natural helper. He credits his focus to his mother. She gave me a vision. You know, a vision outside of the circumstances and where I was. I come from an urban neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. There was a lack of um, resources 
and educational opportunities. So I want to be able to give that to players and at-risk youth. He's always a phone call away. Nicole McGill says she can see the impact on her daughter, Olivia. The high school freshman point guard began training with Therese two years ago. It just goes beyond basketball. He wants to train like the whole person. He's more than a basketball coach. He's like a mentor. He's like a big brother to me. Like, yeah, he's my trainer, but he also takes me to places. He gives me good advice for school and, and just life in general. Seeing huge improvements, um, leaps and bounds. She's become so much more of a aggressive basketball player, um, really focused, very intentional, um, and holds herself accountable. That's where that saying tunnel vision come from. It's about staying focused on what matter. I'm just honored and happy to be a part of these players' journey and that their parents and themselves allow me in. I just want to honestly just do the work. I just want to do the work. Van Pelt has trained hundreds of athletes and hopes to continue to do so by finding a permanent training space to grow his work. Van Pelt hopes to transition to a nonprofit where he can offer his services to youth. Next, we meet up with Lavorne Love. He's a father who's inspiring the community on the north side. Take a look. Potatoes, eggs. So yeah, you're right. Everything's very hands-on. I'm gonna make a, a chimichurri sauce. Lavorne Love is living his passions. It comes pretty naturally for me. So there's be steak, potato, and eggs. In the kitchen. Some colossal shrimp that I seasoned earlier. On the court and behind the chair. He my barber, so he would know. This entrepreneur. I just want to get a nice char on this on the, on the shrimp and the and the sausage. It's not slowing down. But right now I'm just going with you and see where it goes. And in some ways. Kind of like a jack of all trades, I guess you could say. He's just getting started. Now I'm in my 40s and it's like I can, I can finally focus on myself a little bit more. Something his children are excited to see. It, 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 really, it really means a lot. It really means a lot what he's doing, especially just, it's not just in one thing. It's like, it's everywhere, everywhere in, in, in the city. Just in a big old city, this one man's doing all this. So it makes me proud to be the son of that. I was a young parent, I had him at 17. Um, it was a struggle and I just did what, whatever we had to do to make sure he had everything he needed and, you know, give him the, as much opportunity as possible and the things that he was interested in and, you know, it was, it was a fight, but we got through it. I think we did pretty well. Lavorne is the owner of Versatile Hands, a creative space in the St. Anthony neighborhood in Northeast Minneapolis. I come in here and I, you know, I, I feel creative. Um, I feel like I can tackle things and everything's attainable. So it puts me in a good, a good place for sure. For some customers, sitting in this seat is worth more than the service. I need it's like my therapy. I go every other week. It's it's routine. He'll get cut and he'll be here for four hours after the cut's over and we're talking about just everything, you know? So it's like, it just builds relationships and uh, it, it just builds character. I have an absent father in my life, so I look at him kind of like an uncle, um, definitely a good father figure, go to him with a lot of different issues that I have in my life. On the court, Coach Love's impact is bigger than the game. Having somebody who can give life advice is always pivotal in the life of not only myself, but everyone else that's here. Love has been instrumental in playing a, a mentorship role and allowing these young men to intern with him, being a, a male role model. It was just a, a thing that came second nature for me uh, to teach, uh, you know, and, and pass things on. It feels good. It feels good to get back to the community, you know. And in the kitchen. And then I'm going to get the steak going. I need to throw these potatoes in here, too. I was... He puts love in every dish. It's opened a lot of doors for me. It really has. Sometimes even if things aren't looking good or they, they might not be looking the way you envision. But when you get closer to like the, in, the, 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 the final product, it, it just turns into what you watch, thought it would be. This is, and then I was a teenager and he took and he built this grown man who was able to get a basketball scholarship, become a state all-star or, or whatever anything I accomplished. I, I always use like, if my dad can do it, I can do it. Oh, superhero, for sure. I'm just living life. I'm just glad that he didn't, he, you know, he didn't leave me, you know, he was there. Now that he's a young man and he's a young father, I want him to be able to do the same for his son. And yeah, I want him to take all this in and I want to be like my dad when I grow up. Congrats to Lavorne. He's recently engaged. He says he wants to own a restaurant one day and start a program to teach life skills to kids. Growing up, Eric Childs always had a passion for comics. Now he's the owner of Minnesota's only black owned comic book store. He discussed how he's working to keep history and art alive through comics. 
I feel like I'm a spectator at my own life. Eric Childs is living his dream. When I'm in this space, um, I am at home. The husband, father, and artist owns Mind's Eye Comics in Burnsville. How he lives his life is inspired by his favorite superhero. Superman is my original favorite superhero. And it may not be for the reasons that you think. His power is realized by the simple fact that he chooses to love. In choice is where our power is realized. Inside this space, Eric is realizing his own power every day. I am on a mission to make sure things that are important to me and that I think that they're important in general uh, still get the platform that they deserve. A fan of comics since childhood, the Kansas City native became the owner of his favorite comic book store three years ago. He moved Mind's Eye Comics from Egan to Burnsville and has continued filling the shelves. In everything that you see, I've poured my heart and soul into every aspect and nuance, every placement, everything in this space. Um, is uh, is all input from from my mind. A mind his mother helped to shape before she died. I found this old photo, like every photo back then looked like some kind of Hollywood glamour shot. And I was like, wow, mom, this is you, you're beautiful. She was like, oh, you think so? And uh, she told me that when she grew up in the pages and the books and stuff in school, um, there was no one that ever looked like her. And so my mom, she told me that she didn't think she was beautiful. You know, it may seem small. People think, oh, well, we know you're there. You're, you're in the book. You're, you know, you see, you see this person, that person. Once I heard that story, I realized that that stuff matters. So now that I have a little girl, I think about that stuff all the time. I want to be able to, to if I get her a book, I want her to be able to see herself somewhere within that narrative. In this home full of superheroes, one superhero is making sure everyone can find themselves in comic book pages too. There's no part of our past that we, uh, as minorities, don't play a part. To see all these faces of creators in the comic book industry that you never even heard about or even knew that they were the ones that were involved in building this industry that we all know and love, that we were entrusted to do these works. The industry as a whole, I think, embodies what we should be. We should be human beings that are creating marvelous works that inspire, that promote, that engage, that do a lot of positive things within our world, us as human beings. For more information about Minds Eye Comics, visit WCCO.com. We have more ahead on CBSM Minnesota's Black History Month special, including stories of two women working to change the way we access mental health resources and find community support. Sewing groups have often provided opportunities to tell unique stories and build relationships. In Minneapolis, one woman is using her skills to do just that. WCCO's Susan Elizabeth Littlefield shows us how one Twin Cities artist is using fabric and string to stitch communities together. Forward a little bit. Okay. Kiana Cook is a woman of many talents. And I'm gonna cut close to my stitch and voila, a cute little coin purse. A designer, an author, and a master seamstress on a non-material mission. The idea altogether was how could I, as an individual, unite communities all over? Deep breath out. How can I write a positive narrative? Focus on the positive about love through sewing. Good job. Then I'm gonna pull the thread up. Oh yeah, she is ready. Kiana is a proud graduate of North High in North Minneapolis and Savannah College of Art and Design. She now heads up Lovely Sewing, a downtown Minneapolis program for kids from all over the Twin Cities. I love the fact that my kids are coming from Edina, from Plymouth, from Maple Grove, from North Minneapolis. And I encourage this, I embrace this. That's good. Malia's mom says it's been a lesson in art and a lesson in life. We happen to live in the suburbs and we commute to the cities for the class. And I think that's a, a great bridge to gap for her because that's an experience that she doesn't normally get, um, you know, at home. Taking a deep breath in. An experience that starts with yoga so she can center the kids and get their attention. She already has their admiration. 
She's a wonderful teacher. She teaches us cool experience and things. Technically speaking, the needle is going inside like this. Lots of stuff we don't know. That's not so hard. No, it's not hard at all. She makes me feel happy. And happiness is what she's trying to promote amidst a shattered and divided city. I always wanted to create an environment of love. One tangible way that Kiana unifies the class is when they have projects like this, they all have to use at least one patch of the same fabric. So when they take their project home, they'll remember they're all unified. Ooh, it's fluffy. Yeah. A message that's being received. I like to see different type of skin colors and it's like diversity. I'm stitching her up. Kiana Cook, an artist on a mission to weave a city together. We're shifting the mindsets of you one stitch at a time. Good. Susan Elizabeth Littlefield, WCCO 4 News. Cook offers classes to children and private lessons for adults. If you'd like to donate to her nonprofit to sponsor a child through her program, visit WCCO.com slash links to find out how. For some, accessing mental health resources can be tough. However, one Minneapolis woman has created a platform to help black women access mental health resources, and she has her eyes on curating a safe space to share them too. And we're talking about the vision. We're talking about how this will truly be a home for the black community. Um, for Minneapolis. For Lauren Ash, this physical space represents what's next for Global Sisterhood. It's a place to call home for Black women and women of color looking to heal. I really look forward to this space being uh, a space that you enter and are able to exhale. The Minneapolis native is the founder of Black Girl in Ohm, a health and wellness community online. I want my connection to abundance to be unwavering. Since launching in 2014, the Instagram following has ballooned to more than 120,000. The podcast downloaded more than 2 million times. We only need so much inspiration yes. before we need to tap into our own, yes. right? Magazine appearances have followed, including Vogue, Essence, and the New York Times. Experiences like the annual day of wellness have given participants a chance to connect in person. All this a far cry from the community's humble beginnings. I started Black Girl Gnome in the living room of my mentor's apartment. After graduating from the University of St. Thomas, Lauren attended graduate school where she turned to yoga to cope with feelings of isolation. I, as a Black woman, uh, very rarely had a, a Black teacher teaching me yoga, teaching me meditation. I was always longing to be in a space with others who shared my same experiences without question or without, you know, are you really sure this avenue? Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> a conversation with a Chicago mentor would later change everything. She looked at me at the time, you know, I think I was 24 and she heard my vision and she said, when do you want to start? And Within two weeks, Lauren began teaching yoga classes in her mentor's apartment, quitting her job months later to focus on Black Girl and Ohm full time. I don't want to like continue to to create recreate this narrative that that a sign of healing is that you're suffering or that you're constantly going through. Healing can also be an act of joy. In March of 2020, a desire to heal within her own family brought Lauren home to the Twin Cities. Within months, her city needed healing too. Being back home when George Floyd was killed impressed to me the significance of the healing work because there's so much unreconciled trauma that the death of George Floyd brought up for so many of us and the healing work that um, is so needed within um, the black community. So let's go inside. Look at this. Work she's already envisioning here at 4000 Minnehaha Avenue. A dream of a physical space for black girl in Ohm finally coming true. To be able to realize um, a dream that I've had within me for now seven years is really magical. I'm really looking forward to this. Ash has been leasing the space since September. It's located in the Longfellow community in South Minneapolis. She hopes to open that home for Black Girl and Ohm, offering an herbal shop, gift shop space for yoga and one-on-one -on -one or collective healing work later this year. 
Now we bring you to a story of Bob Williams, the first black man to play for the Lakers organization. He passed away in January at the age of 89. Williams joined the team in 1955 when it was the Minneapolis Lakers. WCCO's Mike Max and photojournalist Sam Jones reflect on Williams career and the path he paved for future players. He was the first for the Laker organization, the first African American to play for the franchise. That happened to be located in Minneapolis. That was a that was a big uh, sense of pride for the family, I would say. Bob Williams grew up in the South, in Florida, and when they arrived in Minnesota, they bought a home in Minneapolis and found out quickly there would be an adjustment when a neighbor stopped by to greet them. He said, "We." We whites are really upset because you coloreds moved into our neighborhood. The next day, every house in the neighborhood went up for sale except two homes. The fact he was a professional athlete helped soften the blow, but there were times with his team he was reminded. They went into the restaurant. Um, the owner said everybody can eat here but him. And um, Coach said, well, then we're not eating here, and everybody just got up and left. Most players worked in the offseason at the time. For Williams, the options were limited. The only work Bob could find was washing dishes, mopping floors, and parking cars. He ended up moonlighting with the Harlem Globetrotters in the months outside the Lakers season. I was also fortunate enough to meet uh, Metal Arc Lemon before he middle? passed. Yes, I have a, I have a picture of me, I think I was in sixth grade. But it was Bob who got a thrill meeting in 2015 when the Los Angeles Lakers set up a meeting with Kobe Bryant in his final appearance at Target Center. Kobe came in, turned the corner, and when he saw my husband, he outstretched both arms and hugged and hugged Bob and said, Mr. Williams, Thank you so much for paving the way. When they were leaving, Kobe turned and told them something Bob already knew. He said, I tell young people if the mountain was smooth, you couldn't climb it. This story also has a personal connection to WCCO. Our photojournalist Sam Jones is the grandson of Bob Williams. Thank you again for joining us for this Black History Month special on CBSN. To learn more about the stories presented here, we invite you to visit us at WCCO.com links. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day and remember, Black history is our history.